G'day mate, 40 here. What a wonderful time to learn some Torah with Mark Shapiro talking about the rise of reform and the rabbinic response. It's a history of uh, Chicago's Jewish gangsters. Now the classic book is uh, from a real historian, uh, Jenna Weissman Jocelyn. I mean, the person I'm with is also a historian, but I mean in terms of the Jewish, uh, uh, the classic uh, work uh, from an American Jewish historian is Our Gang, Jewish Crime in the New York Jewish Community. But there's another one. <laughs> it's a very funny book. And it's some, by someone I've known uh, almost my entire life, and that's uh, Meyer Sugarman. Myron Sugarman. Now, the Chronicles of the Last Jewish Gangster, from Meyer to Myron. If you want to be entertained, uh, you can read it. You can watch the videos online. You can even watch it, believe it or not. In the rabbis of Boca Raton, just uh, two weeks ago, uh, interviewed him. And uh, they had to say a few times in the video that we don't condone being a gangster, but it shows you that there's this uh, uh, this fascination that we Jews have with the uh, the people who didn't go the straight and narrow. We all know about the coming and everything like that. But the, the gangster... Okay, so I'm a functionalist and a structuralist. I'm all about power of structure and function like why do we have organized crime because it meets needs that are not being met by wider society okay, it can provide protection it uh, provides strong in-group identity it provides a way to you know, navigate around legal structures it's uh, particularly powerful for immigrants Right, who find that the new world confusing where there's a lack of enforcement right, then, then uh, organized crime can step in and uh, make the rules right? so why did organized crime flourish after the fall of the Soviet Union because it met fundamental needs right? civil society had fallen apart like why do we have rumors and we have rumors because the official information is not adequate to our emotional needs. Right? We, we need more than the official story. And so we turn to rumors to try to speculate. If, if the official news doesn't make sense, <laughs> then you know, we, we, need, we need some way of uh, trying to make sense of the world around us. And uh, that's also a function of organized crime. It's a way to try to help make sense of the world around us. So what's more important, your principles or your interests? Right? There's not a definitive answer. Sometimes principles are more important. Sometimes interests are more important. But if you have gangsters who are members of your in-group and they're doing powerful, important things for your in-group, then you have all sorts of incentives to you know, overlook their gangster behavior. Right? Sometimes there are problems in life, but a uh, gangster is best equipped to handle them. So your principles may not care for their methods, but your practical needs may be best met by, by gangsters. So if you've got a favorite football team, you probably want you know, law-abiding people on the team so they don't get suspended. But what you most want to do is to win. And uh, in the game of life, you know, living is usually the best way to go. So this is Mark Shapiro on the rise of reform in the rabbinic uh, response. I in uh, Rivar and Soloveitchik's book. I, I, I listened to the talk and uh, I misspoke. The, the, the case where uh, it said that a, uh, someone, a Catholic, who said that uh, he's not opposed to all war, just opposed to the Vietnam War, and that was upheld. That was actually, uh, it was the Federal District Court of San Francisco. You get all the information. It gives you the number and everything on page 267. It wasn't a Supreme Court, which explains why Irv Ruderman could lose his case. Uh, someone asked me also at the end of the class, Rabbi Kelman uh, said uh, about the Shulchan Aruch and women and tefillin. 
that um, it says Yeshlim Chos. You should protest, but it doesn't really say uh, uh, actual halachic violations. So let me show you uh, that. Here you have it in, uh, in Shulchan Aruch. So the tefillin are talked about in the Torah, the leather boxes with verses from the Torah in them, and you wrap them on your Jewish man, you wrap them on your left arm if you're right-handed, and put, put one around your head with a little box on your forehead. So traditionally, Judaism holds different roles for men and for women. A lot more commandments demanded of men than for women, because it's expected that women will be busy taking care of the kids. And if you don't hold special roles for men, they will tend to drop out of religion. Right? Men don't like competing with women. So we're at the Marubra State Park. That's where we're at right now. There's a there's a firing range near here. I don't think they're shooting right now. If you look at Sif Gimel, it says Nashi Vavadi Paturi So I have a friend who grew up an Orthodox Jew who was dating, went on a date, took his tefillin bag, so it was called a tefillin date, and spent the night with the woman, got up in the morning and uh, was putting on his tefillin. When he looked over his shoulder, there was his girlfriend who was apparently a student at the Jewish Theological Seminary, which is the conservative movement in Judaism, their seminary. So she was apparently a rabbinic student and he looked over his shoulder and there she was putting on tefillin. But uh, generally speaking, highly unusual for women to put on tefillin. It's a, it's a traditionally a masculine role. So a Kohen, all right, that's the Jewish priest class. Usually people with the last name Kohen are members of the Jewish priestly caste, but not always. Uh, they are forbidden to attend to a set, to, a, to go to a cemetery because they're expected to maintain their focus on the living rather than the dead. And so there are places where a Kohen can't go, such as a cemetery. And then I said no. And I'll tell you why I hesitated. I think I, I realized that I was, I was listening to um, the, um, the class. And by the way, we have, there's two things in particular, two times that this comes in, is to play on our trips. One is when we go to uh, Morocco, one of the places we go to is uh, the, uh, the tomb of uh, the king, the kings. It's, it's, a, it's a sight to behold. And then there's something else. So I've spent thousands and thousands of hours listening to Mark Shapiro lectures. Uh, he's a scholar, he got a PhD from Harvard, he also got uh, his rabbinic certificate, he's a modern orthodox rabbi, he specializes in modern Jewish thought, he's published excellent books such on Jewish theology, changing the immutable on how Judaism rewrites its history. He wrote a biography of Yechiel Yaakov Weinberg. And I just love his mixture of Jewish learning with secular learning. And 
and, and I love how, I don't know, I just love his work, man. Right? When I get tired with traditional methods of Torah study, I you know, study some Mark Shapiro and it gets me excited about Torah again. So I'm walking all around Sydney and listening to hour upon hour of Mark Shapiro lectures, uh, many of them for a second and a third time. It just gets my brain going. It's uh, fascinating, it's good for my neshama, for my soul, for my brain, for my heart. Something which I didn't know the first time I went there, that there's a synagogue in Toledo, not Toledo, that's Ohio, Toledo, and uh, there's two synagogues there. Both of them used to, obviously, what you, they were confiscated when the Jews were uh, expelled, or even maybe, could be even before that, uh, during after the pogroms of 1391. Now, really, they should give it back to us, because uh, they took it from us, and this is part of our heritage, and as well, there's a lot of tourist dollars there, although uh, I don't think a lot of they are obligated to, believe it or not, because uh, it's, uh, there's been yeus, so Jews gave up hope, and it's, it's transferred a few different times. So, yeah, when you give up hope of recovering a lost object, it no longer belongs to you, according to Jewish law. I just never get tired of the ocean and the rocks. Australia, mate, the beaches are our cathedrals. Ownership, but they should give it back, but they're not giving it back. So one of them, it's called the, the Transito Synagogue. And um, after the first time I took a group there, I'm reading a book, and lo and behold, it talks about how knights were buried in there. You know, knights, K-N-I, knights. And uh, I had never heard that before. I didn't know anything. Uh, I contacted uh, the person who takes us around, a very uh, special guy, and uh, she investigated this, and she came back with the report that, no, there are no knights buried there. They had been removed in the 60s. So that was good. But she had been told by uh, one of the people who runs all the tourist sites that nevertheless, even though the knights were taken out, other non-Jews had been buried over the year. So what's your personality type? Would you get onto that ledge right below me? Are you a risk taker? Would you not get onto the, you know, these rocks at all? Right, I think I'm, I think I'm moderate kind of in the middle. I think I'm a huge risk taker, but I'm not a huge scaredy cat either. I have a moderate fear of heights. But yeah, I know some people love to get right on the edge. I remember when I was a kid, my friends, meaning at about age 17, we, we climbed below this bridge and we were able to swing out and it was about a quarter mile drop below us. Right? So, we would just swing there with a quarter mile drop below. And uh, another crazy thing my friends did, which I did not appreciate, was they'd drive crazy in the rain and do you know wheelies and burnouts and uh, that scared me to death. And I'd scream at them, like, stop, I haven't even had sex yet. <laughs> so then you have an issue. Can you go in? Can Kohanim go in? So this takes us to uh, the Shohar. Shulchan Aruch says as follows in uh, Yeridea Shin Ayin Beis it says in Sif Beis Kivri Ovdei Kohamei Nachon Mizaher HaKohen Mileachle It's best it's better that a non pebbed uh, Kohen not go and not walk on them not be in the building with them with non-Jewish uh, uh, So non-Jews and completely secular Jews often think of Jewish law as incredibly inflexible and rigid and a straitjacket. But there's so much flexibility built into Jewish law and the way it is observed and the way rabbis instruct people to observe it, right? It is supposed to be something that enhances your life rather than something that diminishes your life, right? You're supposed to observe Jewish law so that you by, may live by the laws and that they shall be your wisdom in the eyes of the Goyim to quote, I believe, uh, Deuteronomy. And so, yeah, there are often ideals, but if you can't live up to the ideal, then often it's okay to not live up to the ideal. And the Ramah says, even though there are those who are making more, it says, it's best to be So we 
it's that's not strict. It's not a halachic obligation. It's, uh, it's best to be strict. I hear some uh, I hear some Christians saying, well, it's disputed among posting. Of an old level place in the course of the Gentile. So it's disputed as to whether he can enter the Gentile cemetery practically, although the main opinion falls leaning in the village, it's proper not to step on their graves. So that seems to be the general minhag, I think. That minhag means focus, custom. Machlokas uh, means controversy. Dispute. To say it's not an issue, so we don't go there, and uh, I'm glad I know about this now. What I was surprised to see. So see how the rocks peel away? I sure wouldn't like to be up here when the rocks start peeling away below me. <laughs> but it'd probably make for you know amazing video. It's, as I was looking to see what contemporaries say about this today, I came across not a liberal uh, authority, Rabbi uh, Mansour. If you know Rabbi Mansour, he's uh, on the right wing of the Syrians. He has a, the following question: May a Kohen attend the funeral of a non-Jew? And he goes to the sources I just mentioned, and he says, first of all, it's in a chapel or a church. Can't do it. Let's so, Cohen isn't supposed to attend a funeral. It's not in a chapel or a church. Let's say it's just in a, in a room. And he says as follows. He says that the Shulchan Aram technically follows the lineage of the and therefore he concludes, quote, there is no prohibition at all for non Cohen to attend the funeral of a non Jew funeral. Because he says that. Uh, if it's, it's preferable not to do so, but you feel it's necessary as a social or professional formality. It's a good friend of yours or something, and uh, the family would expect it or look bad. If it's in a funeral parlor, he says that uh, you can go. The rabbis often want to try to make Jewish law as lenient as possible so that Jews don't feel like they're sinning. Because if people get too much of a sense that uh, they're just breaking you know, Jewish law at every turn, it will turn them off from attempting any observance whatsoever. So there's a significant movement within Judaism to make observance of Judaism as easy as possible. Because the Ikar Hadin, the halacha is that a Kohen, there's no issue of being the Tame to a... Um, uh, an so Tame means impure, unclean. So I remember when a rabbi at an Orthodox synagogue brought me in and say, hey, you know, here you're writing about the porn industry. And, and he said, you know, I'm sure it's all very academic and that, but it's, uh, we just can't have that in our community. It's, and he's, he's reaching for a word and then he just says, tame, right? It's just impure. It's just, we can't have that kind of filth in our community. Find a little strange about this, though, is he makes such a big deal about it. If it's a chapel or a 